Okay, here we are again. We're going to be uh, reading from the Gospel of John. I'd like to encourage you to turn your books there, please, your Bibles. <clears throat> John, the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Another one of the famous, this is probably one of the most famous adventures of Jesus. Uh, miracles that, uh, probably the most famous miracle in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> By the way, this is the only place that you will read of this in the four Gospels. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Gospel of John, chapter 11. The Gospel of John, chapter 11. I'll be reading from the New King James. Chapter 11, verse 1. There was a certain man who was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters went to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, I'm jumping in the middle of this story, even though it's the first of the chapter, but if you want to read about Mary and Martha and Lazarus, were very, Jesus loved everybody. But uh, these people were very special to him. They were very close. <clears throat> Verse 3 again, Therefore the sister sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Verse 5, now Jesus, what he said there, he's not denying that Lazarus is going to die. He, the, the people that he's talking to, the apostles, some of the disciples that are with him, saying this sickness is not unto death, even though he's going to die, but hold that thought. Verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. Verse 6, So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Uh, <clears throat> let's establish where he was at, or where most people think he was. Remember, uh, man puts chapter breaks in the Bible. Uh, this story is a continuation from the previous chapter. So let's go back to chapter 10, the last couple of verses of chapter 10. We'll start with verse 40. Jesus, and he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. And there he stayed. So this is where Jesus was when they sent. Let's define that word that it was. Verse 41, Then many came to Jesus and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true, and many believed in him there. And it goes right into chapter 11. Uh, let's go to... The Gospel of John chapter 1. I think that's where we find out where he's... <clears throat> where John was... The, John the Immerser was baptizing. That's where Jesus is. Okay? So let's go back to John chapter 1. And I'm telling you this to, to get you to realize how far away Jesus was from Bethany. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Excuse me. Been a long day at work. <clears throat> All right, John chapter 1. Uh, verse 19. Apologize. John chapter 1, verse 19. This is one of them lessons I'm pulling out of my back pocket, and we're studying it together. It's a good study. Verse 19. Now, this is a testimony of John the writer of the gospel. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now this is John the Baptist. <laughs> Don't get them confused. Verse 21, And they asked John the Baptist, What then are, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Verse 22, They said to him, 
Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? Verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. <clears throat> Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Verse 24. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Verse 26, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. Verse 27, it is he who cometh after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. Verse 28, these things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. So now we can go back to chapter 11 and we establish where this was because it's give or take the way the best I can measure it. It's around 30 miles. So what I'm trying to tell you is it's a good distance to get to where Lazarus is living in Bethany. <clears throat> so verse 5 again, chapter 11. Now Jesus loved Martha and Mary her sister and Lazarus, verse 6, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was, Bethabara. Verse 7, then after that, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. Verse 8, the disciples responded and said, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again? All right, go back to John 10, just a chapter before this. Let's go back to verse 31. This takes us back, the best I could tell, about three months, give or take. It takes us back in the winter when we're in John 11, the death of Lazarus. It's in the spring. Uh, we go back to John chapter 10, verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. What's that about? Go back to verse 22. John chapter 10, verse 22. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice. Listen to God's word. We want to be his sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. Verse 28, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and my Father are one. It brings us back to verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone Jesus. Now we go back to verse 8. <clears throat> and we see the reasoning behind the response that the apostles give Jesus when Jesus says, let's go back to Bethany. Bethany is only a hip scotch and a jump out of Jerusalem. So you're in Jerusalem. It's something like a mile and a half, two miles. It's not far at all. So we're going back. And the apostles, that's why they're saying, huh, I don't know if that's a good idea. Verse, uh, verse 8. Then the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again? Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus has only got a short time, and he said, I've got to make use of my time. It's very valuable. Verse 11, these things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And a lot of times sleep is a reference to, in the Old Testament, all through Scripture, uh, a peaceful death. But anyway, verse 12. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, they don't get it. Okay, they're, they're so human. If, if, if he sleeps, he will get well. Verse 13, however Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. When we're sick, we need rest. We need to heal. So, you know, they're looking at it that way because they 
did not know Jesus, that Lazarus died, what they heard was he was sick. Verse 14, Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Verse 15, And I am going, excuse me, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Verse 16, then Doubting Thomas, that, you know, we give him such a hard time. Verse 16, then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Not much doubt there. It depends on how you look at it. But he's willing to go is what I'm getting at. All right. Verse 17, so when Jesus came he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, he's 30 miles, give or take, away. And he waited two more days. And he did that for a reason. And we're going to find out what that reason was. But anyway, it's four days by the time he gets there. You know, if it's a 30-mile trip on foot, that would be a hard trip for me to make in one day walking. All right. Verse 17 again. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Verse 18. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Verse 19. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Verse 20. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, somehow she got news, she kind of silently snuck out and went to meet him. She went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. And it draws a picture here, the normal way for back then in the culture when you were in mourning. You, you can read that in the book of Job and Elijah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, they just sit. You know, sometimes they're sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it's, a, it's in the culture, it's just, and they still do that today. Uh, you can see documentaries and news clips and how they, they're, they're mourning and they're just sitting. And, but John's trying to draw the picture here. Martha sneaks out and goes to see Jesus. This is because she heard he was coming. Verse 20, she didn't tell Mary. And Mary was sitting in the house. Verse 21, now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 22, now why did Jesus wait two days and it's four days, and Lazarus has been in the tomb four days, so that means by the time Jesus got the news on that first day, more than likely, Lazarus died. Verse 22, But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Verse 25, at the last day, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is to us. This will never be outdated. So please keep that in mind. All right, Jesus asked her that question, the response. Verse 27. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Verse 28. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister. If you, you know... Visualize this, use your imagination, get involved in the story. You know, they've got a lot of people around. These are very popular people. They've got family and friends, and they're, they're there supporting the family and the lost. Lazarus, these are very wonderful, highly respected people. So she sneaks in there somehow and gets her attention. And she tells Mary, the teacher has come. Verse 28, when she had said these things, Martha, 
she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. Jesus didn't just want to come in there. He wanted to spend some time privately with these sisters. Verse 29, As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly. Can you see the urgency? I can see her just getting up and running out. And came to him. Verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. He waited there for Mary to come. Verse 31. Then the Jews who were with Mary in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary got up and left, well, you can listen to what it says, they rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Verse 32, Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The same response, faith, faith. Verse 33, But you got to feel, i got to point this out, they're disappointed. They're hurting. They love their brother. They love Jesus. They're all close. And they sent word to Jesus. And they know they got faith. You know, if Jesus had just been here, but he wasn't. And their voice and their, you can feel their disappointment and their concern. Verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now, I've got this underlined, and I have studied this for years, and it's amazing how these words are so powerful and the meaning behind them. This story is loaded with information, information of God's nature, Jesus' nature, the intent, the purpose of life, in life hereafter. I was listening to an interview just last night. I was sitting on the back porch eating my supper. My wife is staying with her mother at night. I only get to see my wife at work. Don't get to flirt with her at work because that's her rules. She don't want me doing that. Anyway, that's another story. So <clears throat> I was out there on the back porch and I'm doing my Bible study and I got my radio and I'm listening to this Christian talk show and this guy was interviewing this atheist. And just listening to this atheist voice his reasoning. And this guy, I've got a lot of respect for, he's a wonderful teacher. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy name. It's Wretched Radio. I don't know if any of you have heard it or not, but this guy has a very interesting way how he approaches people. And he likes to work on the college kids. And this guy was uh, a, a student of religion. It, I, I didn't catch what college he was at, but he was interviewing this guy on the bench. He's so nice. This guy's very intelligent. He's very slick the way he presents God's Word. He's never condemning. And he was talking to this guy, and it's so sad. He doesn't believe in life after death. He believes the life he's living, he's going to live to the fullest, and he's going to live it the way he wants to live it because... Basically, the way I view it, he's, when he dies, he's like Rover, he's dead all over, and that's it. And that is so sad. And you must, there's no hope. Uh, it's, it's a miserable way to live. And we, okay, we had a recording glitch here, and I'm trying to get caught up. I apologize. Uh, I was talking about the guy that was interviewing the college student on the bench who didn't believe in life after death, he wanted to live his... You know, I find that the reason a lot of people uh, do not want to respond to acknowledging that God is real because they want to live life their way. If they respond to God and acknowledge that God is real, they, their conscience, I think we're hardwired for this, that we are obligated in some shape, form, or fashion to acknowledge God by the way we live our life, either reject Him or live for Him. And this college kid, more or less, and this is what the, the guy that was interviewing him, the conclusion that he came up with, so you want to live the party life. You want to live life uh, with no obligation, no responsibility to God. You want to live life your way. And the, the guy was honest. He said, basically, yes. 
And he said, then where are you going to go when you die? He said, I guess I'm going to go to the grave, and that's why I want to live life the way I want to live. I want to enjoy life now. And I'm, I'm, the point I'm getting at is, where is the hope in that? I don't want to live my life knowing or thinking that this is all there is to life. And if you study the Bible, and you, you can't come to that conclusion. And Jesus don't want us to come to that conclusion. He wants us to know that the greatest is beyond us. We're, we're in this box. We live life in this box, and this is all that we see. This is all that we know. And Jesus knows all. And we just got to get out of that concept. And if we believe in Jesus, and Jesus is, you know, it's not outdated. We can't outdate this book. And the whole purpose of living our lives is to acknowledge that Jesus is real. And Jesus, what I'm trying to point out here, I apologize for this glitch. I've got me off track. But if we go back to verse 33, what I'm trying to point out is the importance of understanding why Jesus groaned in the Spirit. And He's concerned with these people. He loves these people. They're very dear to Him. And they're all weeping. They're all mourning. They've lost someone very special to them. So he groans in the Spirit. And, you know, like I said before, it can even, if you translate it in the Aramaic and the Greek, it can bring up this idea of being agitated, very seriously uh, upset, even to the point of anger. And then you read, he was very troubled. All right, verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? And he knew that, but he's wanting them to participate. And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then we have this historical verse that is so short, and it's probably one of the most loaded short verses in all of Scripture because it gives us the nature. I think there's two times that Jesus is recorded of weeping, possibly three in the garden, possibly. But Jesus wept. And you've got to tie it in with verse 33. He groaned in the Spirit, which means he was very troubled with what he's about to do. And he said, where have you laid him? They showed him. He's at the tomb. Verse 35, Jesus breaks down and weeps. And the question that I've asked myself over the years and the conclusion that I've come up with may not be the same one that you will Uh, but I'm going to run it by you anyway. I'm not forcing it on you, but I want you to think about it, tying it back to verse 33. Why did he groan? Why was he agitated? Why was he almost to the point of possibly being angry? And why was he so troubled and grieving? And he wept. Verse 36, Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. Verse 37, And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Verse 38, Then Jesus again groans in himself. He's about to do something. This is his mission. This is why when he found out the news, he waited two days It's four days, and he's groaning in himself again. And he came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Verse 39, Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead for four days. I think the King James, he stinketh. I'm reading from the New King James, but I think the King James. But it's anyway, you know how a body decomposing. And she's telling him that. Verse 40, Jesus said to her, once again, Jesus said to her, verse 40, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Go back to verse 26. 25, I'm sorry, verse 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Self-examination. Please 
examine that yourself and be honest. All right. Take away the stone. Verse 40, <clears throat> he said to her, Did I not say to you, if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Verse 41, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me, that you and I are one. I, Jesus says in later recordings, of you know, he says, I do nothing without it being the Father's will. Verse 43, Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud, audible voice of power that everyone could hear, Lazarus, come forth. Verse 44, And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Why did Jesus groan? And why was he so troubled? The conclusion that I have come up with just works for me. But I want to run it by you because I just want you to think. We need to examine. We need to study. We need to get what Jesus is trying to tell the people and what he wants us as students to understand about this lesson. First of all, the four days, it's undeniable. There's no tricks played here. He knows that the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they, they've already tried to stone him several times. And he knows that they are going to be there and they're going to be watching this or at least the news is going to get to them. And they're always trying to... They can't deny the miracles, but they always try to deny the source. And they always try to put a cloud over it and, and just get the people to simmer down. But these miracles are undeniable. Now, think about this. And... Maybe you already have. There are many places in Scripture that I can take you. Life after death. We must believe. The, the kid on the... I was listening to the radio last night and I was sitting there just praying for this guy. The, 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 the student. He was so nice and so respectful. He wasn't cocky. And the, the guy that was interviewing even told him and complimented him for his respect and you're being honest. And he said, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate him being honest. But I was just praying God opened his eyes, opened his heart. It's, it's so sad to be living life thinking that this is all there is to it. My mother told me a long time ago, I was going through this ordeal, I thought. I was going through this real hard time, I thought, in my life. And I was really experiencing trouble over something. I done forgot what it was. But she sat me down and she said, Son, I want to tell you something. I, don't, I want you to always remember this. The only hell that a Christian, a child of God will ever experience is this life we live. But to the people on this earth that deny and reject God, like this poor college student, the only heaven, the only peace they'll ever experience is this life. And I have never forgotten that. The only hell we'll ever experience, we've got to deal with it. Jesus is going to go through it with us if we believe. And our belief motivates our lifestyle. And we're living that life that's faithful and pleasing to God. And we're sincerely trying Jesus was groaning in the spirit. He was upset and angry because Lazarus was in peace. He was enjoying his reward. And Jesus was about to resurrect him from the dead in that peaceful, peaceful life that we have no clue and bring him back to this world. Go over to... 
Uh, I believe it's the next. Yes. Tell you something else that Lazarus had to face. The very next chapter, chapter 12, verse 9. We're just jumping right in the middle of this. Remember the chapter breaks. Man puts them in their study. Sometimes you don't need to stop your study at a chapter break. You need to continue on. And you need to keep these chapters together. <clears throat> but anyway, John chapter 12, verse 9. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but, they, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Verse 10, but the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. These are supposed to be the leaders of God's people. These people are pathetic. They are so blind. They're wanting to kill Lazarus, assassinating. And Jesus, that's why he was groaning. That's why he was so troubled, because he loved Mary and Martha. He loved the people. He was sad. He was grieving for them. And he was troubled. But he was more troubled and groaning and upset because the glorified God, a miracle that would be undeniable, probably the most famous miracle, to bring Lazarus back to life out of his rest and peacefulness. And Jesus was really having a problem. And that's why Jesus wept. That's why he was groaning. That's why he was so troubled in spirit. Because he had to bring him back. Lazarus had to die again. Verse 10, chapter 12. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, verse 11, because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. It was an undeniable miracle. So as we study this story, and take your time, read it again, put yourself in the story, try to feel, try to feel what Jesus is feeling, knowing what we don't know, Jesus knows all, and he knows about paradise. I'll give you some scriptures to read because we're running out of time. <clears throat> if you'll go over to 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel chapter 28. This is when Saul, the Spirit of God, left Saul. Saul is going to have a nervous breakdown. He's having to come apart. And Samuel has died. That was his connection to God. Saul's connection to God was through Samuel. Samuel had died. And Saul goes to a witch and has this witch with all her trickery to try to bring up Samuel. And she does. And she's astonished. She couldn't believe it. And Samuel said, Saul, why have you disturbed me? He's in paradise. There's life after death. And I can give you many more. It's just... Believe. There's more to this life, and the best part is yet to come if we endure, if we stay faithful, if we believe, and we help others believe. We are God's hands and feet. Believe. Pray. I love you. I hope you get something out of it. Thank you so much.